Thank you, Reverend Michelin Sullivan. And before we move on to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcoming, welcoming to the gallery today uh, the Honourable Myrna Dreger, who is the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba. Now, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 1238 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to, be, to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 1238. Formally moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak. I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 1238 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is topical questions. Uh, in order to get through as many as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions. I call Neil Bibby, question number one. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the cost of the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As I indicated in my letter to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on the 5th of July, the Office of Road and Rail, the ORR, published a report also on the 5th of July <coughs> which identified risks around network rail's increased cost estimates in many cases across the UK, including the Egypt programme. Now, I remain deeply frustrated by network rail's inability to deliver Egypt within their estimated budget. I have therefore written to Chief Executive of Network Rail, Mark Carn, to make it clear that the Scottish Government simply does not accept and is not prepared to accept the long-term cost implications. And to that end, I have instructed Transport Scotland to undertake an intensive review of the entire programme. That review is expected to conclude later this month. Neil Bibby. Reports this project is now behind schedule and over budget due to some fundamental errors are extremely concerning to passengers and taxpayers alike. Further to what the Minister has just said, can he confirm that overhead wires were indeed installed at wrong heights, that bridges were built too low to meet basic safety standards, and that last year alone an extra £32 million pounds was spent on this project and the total bill is set to rise even further. Can the Minister tell us exactly how this was allowed to happen and when will Egypt finally be completed? Minister. I thank the member for the question and I'll try to strike a, a note of consensus. I, I agree with him. I think it's utterly unacceptable and the point of the review is to put network rail through the mill to make sure every single penny that they insist uh, that they say has to be spent in addition to what their estimates originally were, well, we will account for every single, one of those, every single penny. And we expect the parliament, and of course the committees in this parliament, to also hold them to account. And in that end, when I spoke to Mark Carn, I made it very clear that I expect network rail officials to appear in front of this parliament, in front of its committees. It would be unsurprising to the member, I think, if I was to say that sometimes our press does have an element, to, uh, does have a, a, a tendency to over-egg and sensationalise some aspects uh, of transport policy. In terms of the overhead wires, no, the uh, network rail dispute uh, that the figure uh, the member mentions was the case uh, for the cause, cause for the increases. In terms of the cost increases, they're principally due to poor performance and productivity of the contractor, network rail's ineffective management of that contractor, and majorly uh, because of compliance issues which have affected projects not just in Scotland, yep. but of course have had a devastating effect on projects that have had to be cancelled uh, south of the border. Now, I agree with the member, utterly unacceptable. Let's see what the review says at the end of the month. Let's pull them in front of this parliament and let's get answers from Network Rail. Neil Bibby. This is, this is not the only issue to have affected, obviously, uh, passengers this summer. Passengers have had to endure a summer of disruption on Scotland's railways. We've seen the Queen Street tunnel closure, major delays on the Borders Railway and other routes, 12 days of industrial action over staff safety concerns, and now Egypt is delayed and over budget. P passengers have been very patient, but that patience has been put to the limit. And I would say to the government, if they're willing to take the credit for rail infrastructure projects, they've got to take responsibility as well. Can the travelling public therefore now expect an apology from the government for the level of disruption and delays they've experienced over the last few months, disruption and delays which seem set to continue? Minister. It may be a new parliamentary session, but it's the same old Scottish Labour Party, uh, presiding yeah. officer. Yeah. To be accused of a summer of chaos from Scottish Labour is quite ironic, uh, <laughs> may I just say. Uh, in terms of uh, the projects that he outlines, let's just take a few of them uh, that he yeah. quoted. He mentioned Queen Street. That was opened, of course, the tunnel ahead of schedule and under budget. Oh, yeah, well, uh, so let's make that point. Uh, in terms of Borders Railway, of course, it is the anniversary of Borders Railway, and passenger numbers have exceeded 
uh, those forecasts. We should be celebrating that. Yes, there are still some improvements to be made. In terms of the issues around uh, network rail, uh, what I would say to the member is we've instructed a review. That review will report back the causes, uh, will report back what the estimates are in terms of the budget and the timescale. I will certainly ask questions of Network Rail. I expect every member to do that. I would gently make the point to the member that this, uh, these overestimates uh, were made the matter of public record on the 5th of July. I've not had a single piece of correspondence from the member who's the Shadow Transport Secretary oh. until two months, conveniently on the first day that Parliament comes two back. Two months? Colin John Mason. The, I understand the Queen Street Tunnel project is a distinct project but also overlaps with Egypt and can he confirm that that did go smoothly, that the, the closure was acceptable and that some of the work like lengthening the platforms has already happened in preparation for Egypt? Minister. Yes, I'm pleased to say that the Queen Street uh, Tunnel closure and then the improvements that have been made to Queen Street Tunnel have been, have been successful. Uh, but that's not to take away from the fact that we are still disappointed about the potential delays and the overestimates in terms of the cost uh, associated with Egypt. So we will instruct that review, it's already ongoing, and then we'll put uh, network rail uh, under scrutiny for that. Uh, Jackson Carlo. Uh, one of the hallmarks of the uh, upgrade of the railway line so far has been the engagement with the public well in advance of each of the potential disruptions or delays. I think many people, however, were astonished to find that with just a few days' notice there was to be no train service between Glasgow and Edinburgh after 8.30 in the evenings from Sunday through to Thursday uh, and late start on Sundays itself. Does he feel that the public information and awareness of this very considerable change was adequate? Yes, I think the member raises a very fair point indeed. Uh, I think the Queen Street tunnel closure went very well because of the front-footed nature of the communications and thanks to my predecessor uh, for that. I would agree I've had a number of members uh, write to me, uh, email me, uh, get in touch with me about the fact that these uh, disruptions uh, weren't communicated in advance. I think that's something ScotRail should reflect on. I'll certainly have a conversation with them and indeed with my own officials in Transport Scotland in terms of communication on how that should be handled better. Question number two, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take in response to the findings of the Audit Scotland Report, Scotland's Colleges 2016. Minister Shalane Somerville. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Audit Scotland Report, Scotland's Colleges 2016, is a helpful in confirming that Scotland's college sector is financially stable overall and that colleges continue to exceed their targets for the amount of student learning to be delivered. More generally, the report highlights what is working well and where improvements can be made. We will work closely with the Scottish Funding Council and colleges to consider the findings and recommendations and to ensure that we continue to deliver on the successes that we've had, such as full-time students under 25, increasing by 13% since 06-07. Davish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will know that the 2015 Audit Scotland report said it was unclear what savings from college mergers have been achieved and what the full costs of the merger process are. Audit Scotland delivered this indictment last year and again delivered it just last week. Today, more than 2,000 college support staff are demonstrating over pay. Will the government publish the real costs of college mergers so, so that staff taking industrial action and parliament know the truth, as Audit Scotland indeed recommended? Minister. Thank you. Well, I'm sure Tavish Scott will have read in detail the Scottish Funding Council's report, The Impact and Successes of Mergers, which already goes into this in great detail. It does estimate the cost for mergers to be at £69.6 million. That's a one-off cost. But the savings each year to be £52.2 million. And I know from the summer visits that I've had from campuses across the country that we are already seeing success and better outcomes for students, um, decreased duplication and a high quality learning environment for the students. So I think that Scottish Funding Council report, which I've mentioned, already details the work that Tavish Scott has asked for. Which, thank you, Presiding Officer, which begs, of course, the question why Audit Scotland made the same recommendation uh, twice, but the Minister might just simply want to reflect on that. Uh, Audit Scotland say there, have been, there has been rather a 41% decrease in college students and a 48% uh, decrease in the number of part-time places at colleges, uh, which has particularly affected uh, women. Does the, does the uh, Minister now wish to say what steps uh, she and her government are going to take to recognise the impact of college mergers uh, on part-time students and what she's planning to do to reverse the cull of these college places that are so essential, particularly for women? Minister. Well, the member will be very well aware that we laid out in our manifesto our commitment to 116,000 full-time equivalent places. We've kept that commitment within the college sector. 
And the entire basis for the college uh, policy that we have is to ensure that we are providing the adequate and the correct courses that are required for the employers in that area. And that's what we're seeing is full-time courses leading to employment. Now, that's not to say that uh, short-term courses are not being funded. Of course they are. Those that are leading to employment are still being funded. And for example, we're seeing 97% of learning hours in 2014-15 being delivered on courses that lead to recognised qualifications. That's a direct impact that it will have to the economy in the local area. And the member also refers to the, the place of women within our college sector, which is, of course, something that's extremely important. That's why I'm delighted that the gender imbalance within courses is still showing that um, women are in the minority within it, women within are within the majority in the college population that's 52 percent in 14 15 but we're not resting there and we're also making sure with the gender action plan that the scottish funding council has taken out that we're taking action on specific courses where gender imbalance does exist there's also the member should bear in mind that the number of women in full-time courses has of course increased by 16 percent since 06 07 Colin Liz Smith. Thank you. Uh, Minister, you mentioned the um, Scottish Funding Council and in Audit Scotland's report, both on colleges and in universities, questions have been raised about whether there's been a lack of clarity in the role of the Scottish Funding Council and whether it comes to outcome agreements and the discussions with individual colleges and universities, whether that is uh, in any way particularly clear. Could I ask what the Scottish Government is doing to respond to that criticism? Minister. Well, as I said in my initial answer to Tavish Scott, we are working with the Funding Council and with the colleges to, to take on board the recommendations that are within the college report and within the university report that has been mentioned. And if there are lessons for the government to learn, we'll do so in partnership with the Funding Council and with the colleges and universities. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes topical questions.